All right, we're live with my brother, my cousin, Abel Asfal Tafari in the building. What's up? My man has uh, a lot of experience in the cannabis industry, in soccer, and in the military as well. So we have a lot to discuss, a lot of different angles and perspectives that we could hear from sharing his story. Why don't we start off with the easy one? Because you're already rocking a jersey. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the jersey you're rocking and then all your experience in soccer, whether it's the Hispanic underground tournaments, the <laughs> Ethiopian Federation here in North America, or, or your stint with Chivas as well. I mean, you know, this is Barcelona right here. It's my favorite Spanish team. Uh, my ba my first and foremost team is always going to be, I don't know if you like see it, Arsenal. That's what I got on my arm right there. So I'm an Gunners. Arsenal fan. I became an Arsenal fan when I saw Thierry Henry first play, and I got to witness what the stuff he can do, and I was just a big fan. Um, you know, I played all throughout high school, and, you know, I joined Arsenal FC Academy out here in the States. From there, I was able to go to one of the top – uh, community colleges in the world, which is Mount San Antonio College, Mount Sac. And I won a um, state title, national title. Let's go. 2009. And then uh, after 2009, um, you know, I went into the military from there. And then I did my little trainings, did my little stint. And then I came back in 2012 to go back to school full time while I was in the reserves of the Marine Corps. And um, I, I came back to Mount Sac 2012 and won another state and national title. Got recruited, mm -hmm. went to Cal State LA, and then I was there for another two years on a full ride and won two more state titles and won NCAA Division II Western Regional title. So, uh, you know, soccer has been a part, main part of my life. I was passionate about it. You know, it's, if I wasn't that interested in school, I was doing good in school in order to be continuously playing soccer. So it always motivated me and everything. Um, you know, underground makes the Spanish leagues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, hypothetically speaking, these leagues, uh, when they going on and everything, you know, is after, you know, when you're good, you're getting, they offer some people extra cash to go pay in these leagues to help make their team better because, you know, there's prize tournaments and everything. So uh, I've always been, you know, the minority on these teams because it's all Hispanic players. I'm literally the only black guy on team on Mount Sac, even when I went to Cal State LA. You know, there was maybe one other half black, half white guy on the team that was on there from Canada, but. Uh, yeah, I've been majority like my minority in every team, but it always made me have to work twice as hard to go get that spot and prove myself. Um, ESFNA, you know, that's always like that's, that's just dope because I don't have that strong of a Ethiopian background, meaning like I don't speak it that well. I understand it a hundred percent. But you know, I can understand it and say certain things, but I can't hold a f consistent conversation. You know, uh, but it was always an honor and a privilege to go out there and play in the tournaments. You know, especially for my city and win the turn. I was able to win two championships with LA Stars. So, you know, it was cool being around all my people in that environment. And, you know, you get that you know belief, you get that reminder and everything of who you are. You know, your background and so forth. So, uh, it's been it's been an entertaining life so far. So I've been very privileged. Bro, that's like four championships we just talking about. Like that's crazy on the junior college level with Mount Sac with LA Stars. Where where was it when the LA Stars got the the dubs? Was was one of them in DC or where where were those before, championships? Before me, I know they wanted in other places. One was in LA. They wanted them there out here, and then I think one was in Houston. They want another one. I don't know where the other three. They won three before I joined the team, and after I joined, we won two more. That was in San Jose, and the second one was in Toronto. That's right. And you and I won together twice when we were in the, the little league version of the Ethiopia Soccer League. Yeah, too. Yeah, I we posted together. one of those pictures yeah, <laughs> recently. Yeah, Col Coliseum, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, me, you and yep. <laughs> In Atlanta, too, boy. Remember remember, you made us miss the award ceremony from uh, Haile Gabriel <laughs> Nase, with, the with runner? Me, with Coach Million? Yeah, team. bro. R.I.P. Yeah. R.I.P. Yeah, with Million, we got, we got introduced to him, man character <laughs> <laughs> bro we smoked them it, it really wasn't even fair it was almost like bullying or something the way i remember i was goalie and i was laying down you know what i mean in the goal post for a lot of that time like so you got these championships in junior college you got championships with the ethiopian soccer federation of of north america which had to be canceled this year otherwise people were about to link up in a couple weeks but then i remember you also had a, a short stint with the chivas didn't you the former team of, of la now they've been replaced by la football club yeah but, uh, when chivas was out here they, were, they had the under 23 reserves and then um 
I, I from Mount Sac, I was able to get recommended and recruited onto that squad. So I played there for a little bit until, and then when my season started back up from Mount Sac, um, and pretty much after that, uh, that team ended up folding. There was no more to us. <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing to go back to. <laughs> hey, no worry, bro. They got LA Football Club. That's that's the new joint. Yeah, they built yeah, the stadium yeah. near uh, yeah, yeah. USC now. I'm sure you've seen it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Is it actually the funny because you know I went I went to I just graduated from Cal State LA played soccer there and that's where LAFC's home stadium a home practice field is and everything. I didn't know that. Yeah, so LAFC home stadium is right across the street from Cal State LA and they have their own practice facility, everything and stuff. And they hooked up LA uh, Cal State LA with like a brand new turf field also. So before we just had grass. That's sick. I'm, I mean, you don't want to be the first person in turf field. I remember in my high school football days, we added that in the beginning. And those first people before you wear it in, it's, it's rough, especially like in the valley heat, like where I was at. Hey, you're, <laughs> it, trying, to, you're trying to slide, you know? <laughs> oof, yeah, oof. man. I mean, you, yeah. you, play, you play rugby. You ever played rugby on turf? Uh, I didn't play rugby on turf. I, I, I've been in a bunch of different crazy fields. Uh, I remember the weirdest one was uh, Cal State Long Beach, your sister okay. school. And it had this big dip, like when you go to their field, like you're, here's your street level, and then you have to dip in. And it's, it's almost like you're going into like where a, a meteor was. And so the, the crowd looks down into you, and you're like in this like fishbowl, this giant fishbowl. Okay. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I haven't been to Cal State Long Beach. I haven't seen their stadium really. Yeah, that that was probably the the weirdest field. Everything else was pretty straight. I remember the flattest, easiest place to to be was Arizona State University when we played them. They crushed us. They had way more people, um, but we liked being home too. You know, we were in Malibu, so we had to get to look at the beach whenever we were we were playing. So okay. that was dope. What what position were you playing? Let the let the folks know what position. Or did you switch positions? I mean, I played all different types. I'm sorry, I'm just. Plug it in my phone into the charger. Are you good? It's, it's um, organic, baby. It's organic. No worries. Uh, I played all types of positions. I played forward, man. I played uh, lately, like the last like 10 years I've been playing is like center mid. Um, but I played like center mid and defense in my main positions. Yeah. You know, I have nowhere near the experience that you do, but I played okay. defensive, uh, defensive mid in my senior year of high school. That's the only year I actually played for a team, you know, besides that little league stuff that we did in the Ethiopian <laughs> federations. But actually we had, you know, we had, I don't know if I, you remember this at the time at my school, we had the varsity team, which had only two seniors. Right. And then they had the JV team, which had maybe one senior on there with a bunch of like different freshmen, sophomore, whatever. And then we all had this idea because you had to do two seasons out of the year. And we had all this crazy idea. I was mainly a football guy. Other people had different sports. We said, what if we all rushed them? What would they do? You know what I mean? Like they can't cut everybody. Like what are they going to do? So we all like 14 of my friends decided to just let's all play soccer. And we usually like some of them did volleyball. Some of them did basketball. Like we were not soccer players, but we were just like generally athletic and we, we like playing. And so we come up and they had no idea what to do with this. So they invented a team called JJV which is junior, junior varsity. <laughs> and if you know, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as JJV. So we couldn't be in a league. We couldn't compete with people. So what did you say? I can't hear you as well. It's like a frost soft team or something. That's what they call it. So it's like a frost soft team, except we had 14 seniors. So we were overgrown. So you, you know what I'm saying? You like a fresh. <laughs> we played, uh, bro. We played a school called Nuju, which is the this Jewish co-ed frosh off team, and it was brutal, bro. We brutalized them. It was ridiculous. So, but all, but we we had no league. You know, we were not a part of CIF because there's no such thing as JJV. So we just ran exhibition games, and we would just challenge random people. Yeah, like these 18 year old kids going against these 13, 14 year old kids, bro. <laughs> oh my god, it was not fair. It was hilarious. I remember I had a Taekwondo background, so one time the ball was in the air. I did like a flying kick and I hit the ball in the air and the ref came at me and the ref was so damn pissed at me. And he said, high kick, high kick. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. Like, I didn't even know the rules. You know? <laughs> I didn't know you're not allowed to like kick the ball above the waist, bro. Some of those rules, you know. You're just out here like roundhouse and kick, like roundhouse kicking people and stuff. You know what I mean? In the spirit of Chuck Norris, Chuck Norris was big back then. <laughs> Everybody was making Chuck Norris jokes. So I had to incorporate, you know, uh, what I knew, I remember even one team we played, there were gopher holes on the field and they told us about it and they said, can we call it a draw because our team doesn't feel safe? And we're like, nah, bro, 
we're ready to play. <laughs> we don't care if it collapses, like we're ready to play. So they had to lose, you know what I'm saying? But they didn't want to, but their coach forfeited. And so we got a dub on our record for that. You know, our team went undefeated. And we even had two of the senior players were jealous. So they dropped down from varsity and played and practiced with us sometimes. Just because we look like we were having more fun. You know what I mean? Like our, our practices would just be like, uh, what is it called? Just scrimmaging. Like all we do practice was just scrimmaging. There was no drills. It was just scrimmage. Yeah, y'all were the new wave. <laughs> you know, that's what we did with our uh, with our senior itis, you know. And and that's on a on a lighter note, but on a darker note, and we talked about this a little bit off camera, but you know, you mentioned it also a little bit already on camera. You had experience in the military, and I know as a black man and a in Cali who grew up in Cali, you know, that doesn't define everything of who, who you are, but we've seen, you know, tensions. We've seen, there was a, a more Nubian looking brother who was Egyptian, who was mouthing under his breath, you know, while he was standing there with the national guard, that yeah, black lives it. matter. You saw that? It. Yeah. He yeah. was, uh, he's Egyptian, but he's from Southern Egypt, which is called, you know, upper Egypt. So the, the darker Egyptian. So, you know, everyone thought he was just a black American and he's definitely black, but he was Egyptian, you know, yeah, still and, African. Uh, still African. He's still African. He's still African. I'm just saying that because, you know, there are different, um, you know, there are more white passing Egyptians out true, there. True. But for sure, for sure, he looked like he could have been one of our cousins, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I just wanted to get your your feedback on on what you've been seeing, you know. Um, you know, ha happy belated Father's Day too, right? Because <laughs> yeah, you got to yeah. take care of you and yours during this crazy yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, being a black man in the military, um, you know, I, I me, I can say on my end, I didn't experience too many, too much racism when I was in there. You know, it wasn't like no one giving me extra work to do, no one talking to me. But um, for me, it was like I just I, I had a vision of what I wanted to do when I went in. And I just kept to that vision, which was like I went into the military, not like, oh, gung ho, love my country. You know, this and that <laughs> and so forth, like America, you know. America, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Team America. America. <laughs> You know, but like, no, nah, I went in because I just, I literally, you know, I needed a change in my life and certain things that I was doing. I wanted to get like, I, I needed to get some type of discipline still. I wanted to get myself to a type of fitness level that, you know, I, I knew I could get in the military. And also, you know, you don't really hear too many Ethiopians joining the military as well. You know, so it's just something that like, you know. I know a I, few. You'd be surprised. I, I know a few. I know I, a few. I've, I've yeah. seen a few and met a few, but yeah. it's not like, you know, yeah. you see, like I say, the next 30 Ethiopians you meet is not like no. they served time. They served in the military and so forth, you know. Handful. Even yeah. even the ones I know, I, I know four, including you, you know, Elias. Yeah. I got a, a, you know, a homie up in the Bay, Million. I know a cat named Robel. So literally, I know four people. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like. You know, when we when I went in there, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to try something different. You know, that's, that's everything I've done in my life is just trying to be some something different than what the normal person is doing. You know, so when I went in and that's why I chose the Marines, like it's the best, it's, you know, it's the best of all four branches training wise and, you know, just respect wise. So I went in there, you know, I did my time, learned my job, everything. And so, you know, when I came back and so forth, it wasn't like, all right, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a black man. At the end of the day, I'm Ethiopian. At the end of the day, I have my other principles and stuff I stand for. You know, if it's in the military, just because they tell me to go kill someone or something, you know, I wouldn't. If I felt <laughs> uncomfortable about it, I would not be doing it. You know, if I got to be thrown in jail or something, all right, throw me in jail. But I'm not going to go cause harm to certain people and fight something that I don't personally believe in. You know, other people may feel different. I, I was around people that was just like. Send me, send me whichever direction, you know, like tell me where I got to go and fight and everything. You know, it's good to have that attitude and have that energy, which I feel personally should be targeted towards something specific, you know, and towards something that makes a difference in a positive way. I like that, bro. That's like, you know, Muhammad Ali decades ago. He said, I'm not going to go out there and kill some Viet Cong when y'all are out there killing us on the daily. And he, yeah. he spent jail time, you know, for his his personal convictions and you sound very like practical and functional like you used it for a purpose you know they used you but you used them i just had a, another brother who was in the military in north dakota on just a couple hours ago on on my program here and same thing like you he he used it for the purpose of discipline and now he's working in higher education i know you used it to get a little bit more discipline in your life focus make them you know pay for your for your studies your education and then what i love is everybody seems to be pushed into this life where you know it's it's all about being 
in employed rather than being more self-employed and, and focus on entrepreneurship and other stuff. And I noticed for years you've been you've been on this push. I even saw you sponsored one of these events when I used to work with um, Habasha LA. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And my girl Ida, who I need to get on the show too soon. But uh, you you had this idea to, like you said, be different, be set apart, not just be doing things that other people are doing. Hypothetically speaking, how 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 would a Habasha's experience be in the cannabis production? Habasha's experience was definitely very non-existent. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's very different speaking. Like I know, you know, hypothetically speaking, you know, it's just you take a lot of risks. You know, to to get for me to get into this, it wasn't like I had someone older than me, I had a big brother, cousin, or so forth. Someone to explain this. This was something that you know I had a friend i was you know I'm, i got a lot of friends out there they someone brought me on and explained how something ra ran and worked but for me like i always have this mi mindset where it's like how can i do this better you know and how can i if there's something i'm very passionate about how can i do this on my own or so forth so you know i went starting work working you know if you're someone in Vavish that wants to go this route, hypothetically speaking, you would, you know, go and work in a, you know, dispensary, learn how they do it, how they operate and, you know, inventory and manage employees and so forth. And, you know, from there is just you save a lot of money, save as much as you can. You don't go out and party, you just be disciplined in that aspect. And for me, you know, being in the Marine Corps, that's something that it taught me, pretty much it taught me is how to, how to adapt and overcome, how to adjust to any situation. You know, if you, you can either go to sleep regular seven eight hours nine hours ten hours or you can go to sleep three hours get up and be excited about what you want to do and you know be more proficient at what you want to be at so i love that so that's that's exactly what i you know i'm someone that can just go to bed at 3 a.m wake up 7 a.m like i just had a full eight hours sleep you know and that's on top of playing soccer school and everything and so what i i was able to go about that and i and i spend my extra time learning you know and when you go learn somewhere don't always look at what can you get like don't try i never went somewhere like oh i want this much money i need this and so forth for me it's what can i learn what can i learn what can i do stuff and if i can make money on top of it that's cool but now i got this trade that i'm you know getting better at and throughout these times and everything now you know i'm the head cultivator for a recreational shop out here fully licensed you know so it's very it was very struggling at times and you know i'm just glad all those times you know i really grinded and struggled and you know, people think it's just fun. You know, people think it's easy just to, you know, grow cannabis or be in the business. But it's, it's hard work, you know, is learning a whole a whole new trait, a trait set or trait skill that you're not even really accustomed to. So to be able to do that, you got to really have a lot of patience and be willing to grind just like you're willing to do any other job. Yeah, I appreciate hearing that. Like there's a there's a dedication and, and hard work that's incorporated in this craft. It's not, you know what I mean? It's not like the stereotype of some stoner. Like you have to be a hard worker. You know what I mean? I mean, Biggie laid down the 10 crack commandments year ago, years <laughs> ago, right? And when we yeah, were kids yeah. in the in the nineties, but it's not any old thing. Like you, you can't slack off. It's not like something just sells itself. And on top of that, uh, people in this cultivation industry have had to deal with the rapidly changing laws. I know right now we're in 2020, was it January 2018 when they started really changing some stuff up here in California? And and really, we were pioneers in California from the early early 90s. So, yeah, yeah. how how is how has that been in the in the changing legal environment? And I always think about that because I, I studied politics early on, and really, it's politics. Like these <laughs> politicians yeah, exactly, are always they exactly. they playing games. Even from what little I understand of the of the industry, I see that they're still looking down on the the cottage farmer, which so I think, you know what I mean? Versus like, like the, crazy, the big like before, capital. Yeah. Before 2018, like, you know, I had my own shop in Torrance and I had my own dispensary. And so we were like killing it for like two years. And then when the whole legalization came around, we're like, all right, we don't have the capital to go compete with these big boys. So we're going to sell whatever we have here. And we're going to, for me, I just became a consultant for other shops starting up. So I was able to like, a lot of people want to get into the business, but they have no knowledge of what to do. And they don't even know how to like properly distribute their sales across people or what's their demographics or anything. So for me, having that experience, I just came in and be like, all right, look, this is how we should do certain things. This is, you know, as simple as saying like, you guys should have your daily deals on these days. This is how you guys should, this is your demographics where you should target based on where you guys are setting your shop at. 
And also, if you want to cultivate your facility, I'll help you set it up and tell you how to do things and so forth. So, you know, just because it closed one door, you know, I was able to open another door. And so, That's dope. yeah, and, you know, for me, it's not just because it's that, it's that easy or anything. It's just for me, I just, you know, I'm a hustler at the end of the day. Like, I'm always going to go out there and find opportunity, you know, just because while I'm also doing a good consultant, it was took it as a sign. You know, I went, I eventually had my daughter, you know, a year later, I got married afterwards uh, to my beautiful wife. And now uh, I went back to school and I just graduated, you know, so I'm always just trying to like. Perfect. Oh, I didn't know about what you go back to school for. I didn't know about that one. Yeah, I just graduated this past uh, May. I got a, my bachelor's of science in computer information systems. And uh, more like, you know, I really like to do if it wasn't, you know, doing cannabis, I was really wanting to become a data analyst. And, oh, nice. Yeah. Or work in network uh, systems. So, you know, I always have, I also have that skill set and stuff that I learned. And I'm also like trying to get, as soon as I get, you know, this job settled in and where I'm at and have everything under control, like. You know, I want to take extra classes or, you know, learn more and so forth. Because that's just like I can put data into cannabis. You know what I'm saying? hundred percent. It's not one or the other. They're not yeah, mutually yeah. exclusive. Like yeah. everything is needs data. Exactly. Exactly. You should never be comfortable. And I, I believe someone should just always be grinding. You know what I'm saying? Like as much as they can. And especially in our family, you know, me and my wife, like, you know, my wife has her own soccer training business. You know, she wow. came here from Canada. That's where we met in college at Cal State LA playing soccer came here from Canada and, you know, doing little minuscule jobs here and there, you know, hypothetically speaking, because whole, uh, what's that? You can't work without, yeah, anyways. So, uh, <laughs> you know, she was doing babysitting gigs and so forth here and there, but now she got her own business, which is training all these kids in Beverly Hills, going to uh, work for Unified School District and all this stuff. And she's passionate about soccer. She likes it and everything, and, you know, that's what she does now. So, um yeah, never be complacent and always got to be striving for more. But that's just, so this is what me and my wife like to do and instill in ourselves and remind each other. That's really encouraging, man. I, like a lot of a lot of people could take from that hustle, from that level of dedication. And I hope they practically apply to your life. Did, did I hear you say you're still playing as well? Are you still playing soccer or still not? Playing, bro. I'm still playing. I'm out here still grinding. I'm just, you know, I don't think I'll ever stop playing soccer. I'm going to be like your dad and my dad. You know, we still always going to be out there. Uh, LA stars OGs yeah but like for me you know like I'm 29 now and you know I probably f physically myself have like until 35 until I can like play to my maximum cap capacity before I start slowing down a little you know so I really want to take advantage of these next years you know playing with on these high uh in these high level competitions and I still be playing with my boys that I play with in college and everything so we still got a good level of, of playing playing field and everything that's cool, man. Well, we're coming to a, a close now. I just want to give you an opportunity if you have any parting words or if you have anything to plug, you could plug it in. If you have any links, I could throw it up on our YouTube page as well. Uh, there's no really links or anything. I mean, you know, just always just always be don't be complacent. Just always be wanting more for yourself, you know, especially like us, for us being Ethiopians and being minority in this country, let alone, you know, if you're confident and you feel good about something like pursue it and pursue it to the max. Don't ever just be oh, I kind of do it and just half-ass it and whatever, you know, like that's just really going to bite yourself at the end, you know, but I would say just be focused, be determined, be prepared, always be striving for more and just work hard and be consistent. The worst thing you can do is just stop. As long as you're consistent, one thing I learned in life, being consistent, an opportunity is going to present itself as long as you're doing what you got to do. And when the opportunity presents itself, just go and take it.